In May of 1945, a Douglas C-47 Skytrain known as the Gremlin Special crashed into a mountainside of the Balium Valley during a military sightseeing mission, leaving the passengers at the mercy of a mysterious and primitive cannibal tribe of New Guinea and launching a heroic rescue mission. The flight, carrying 24 men and women stationed in the country, was overflying a hidden valley nicknamed Shangri-La after the Tibetan paradise described in the novel Lost Horizon by James Hilton. The tricky terrain, with beautiful scenery of dense rainforests and thick clouds, was under Dutch control and could only be viewed from the air. With World War II approaching its climactic ending, Allied personnel stationed throughout the Pacific clamored to see the mythical location while they still had a chance. Those lucky enough to find themselves aboard the Gremlin Special would earn a certificate inducting them into the secret Shangri-La Society for making the trip. At the time of the war, much of the island of New Guinea remained uncharted as part of the Dutch East Indies. Hundreds of plane crashes occurred there, with few ever being found. As author of Lost in Shangri-La, Mitchell Zukov has stated, quote, New Guinea was sort of a graveyard for planes. On May 13, 1945, the sightseeing Gremlin Special left Jayapura with 19 soldiers plus five crew people on board, and was flying low between the mountains so that the passengers could see the native villages and fields in the valley. The Balium or Shangri-La Valley was 40 miles long, 8 miles wide, and inhabited by around 100,000 to 120,000 tribespeople of the Dani tribe. The terrain was lush and beautiful, but treacherous. During the flight, the plane slammed into the side of a mountain in the Balium Valley. The exact cause of the crash remains unknown, but low-lying clouds may have obstructed the pilot's view and contributed to the crash. In the aftermath, three survivors were left to brave the jungle. Corporal Margaret Hastings of the Women's Army Corps, and Sergeant Kenneth Decker and Lieutenant John McCollum of the United States Air Force. Some sustained injuries, such as Corporal Hastings, who had suffered mild burns on her legs. While the reason for the collision is still a mystery, Lieutenant McCollum would later recount how the tail of the airplane had been broken off and the fuselage flattened out. It was also on fire. Small explosions reportedly started taking place all over the plain. He jumped out at the Gremlin Special and into the remote valley. Of the location, he would say, quote, Standing around, I looked at my watch and said, This is a heck of a place to be, 165 miles from civilization, all by myself on a Sunday afternoon. He was the only one of the survivors not injured, and also the highest ranking, so he quickly took charge of the situation. From where they had landed, the survivors had a decent view of the surrounding villages and the valley itself. Lieutenant McCollum was able to spot a clearing where he believed they might have had a better chance of being spotted by rescuers, if any were sent for them. The three survivors trekked through dense jungle and down a steep, treacherous gully. They walked down 11,000 feet in three days and finally reached the open area optimal for being located from above. All they had to do was wait and deal with the unknown threat of the cannibalistic natives. In the clearing, the survivors encountered the residents of the valley for the first time. The local Dani tribe has been compared to Stone Age populations. They had yet to discover the wheel or pottery, and were in fact only discovered by the Western world in the 1930s. While the people of the valley were known to reside there, few to no close encounters had happened between them and the Western world. Explorer Richard Archbold had led expeditions into the valley, originally naming it Groot's Valley with one of those expeditions resulting in an incident that almost killed the Dani man. Yet his focus of study were flora and fauna, rather than the people of the valley. Other than what could be learned from his brief encounters, the tribe was a mystery to the rest of the world. As no encounters with the Dani had been as close and prolonged as the one the survivors of the Gremlin Special would experience, rumors of bizarre cultural traditions dominated perception of the people among Westerners in the country, making the survivors understandably nervous. Terrifying rituals and superstitions were said to be practiced, and the Dani were supposedly highly militaristic, often engaging in ritual combat with neighbors and against outsiders. Thankfully for the Gremlin special members, they did not find themselves in immediate conflict with the Dani. 
The smiles of the three survivors were quickly met with a smile from the tribal leader himself. As McCollum recounted, quote, He finally got real close, and I reached out and grabbed his hand, and he grabbed my hand, and from then on we were all friends. A reason for the friendly approach might have been that the Dani believed in a word-of-mouth legend that spoke of white spirits descending on the valley and aiding their people. When the Gremlin Special didn't return to the American base in Jayapura, then known as Hollandia, search aircraft were dispatched. The three survivors were spotted on the ground during an air search on May 17th, four days after the crash. Two medical paratroopers were deployed to the site, followed by ten other support troops, including Filipino-American soldiers who had volunteered to be a part of the on-ground rescue effort. Documentary filmmaker Alexander McCann was also parachuted to the site so he could document the rescue attempt, as well as any interactions with the native tribespeople. McCann was nervous to be around the Donnie, so he drank a bit before departing. He recalled hitting the ground drunk and then staggering to his feet. The paratroopers set up a camp to treat the survivors and assist them before leaving Shangri-La. The doctors on site decided that waiting for a couple of weeks and treating the wounds of the survivors in the valley would be crucial for their recovery. They had their first full meal in days and a chance to clean themselves a bit. In the beginning, Sergeant Decker and Lieutenant McCollum did not receive spare clothes, as most donations had been sent to Corporal Hastings. Soon enough, however, more clothes, medicine, and food were parachuted down, while over the course of a few days, Corporal Hastings' burns were treated. The Donny kept interacting with the survivors, and now with the rescuers as well, being documented on film for the first time by Alexander McCann. The female leader of a tribe, referred to as the Queen by McCann in his documentary, invited Corporal Hastings to visit her tribe, seeing the Corporal as the leader or Queen of her troop. The rescuers and survivors then had the opportunity to visit this village, a revealing and peaceful experience for all involved. Some of the Donny gifted pigs to the visitors, which the Filipino members of the rescue crew roasted in a traditional way, a feast typically reserved only for the most special of occasions. The Donnie and the crew traded and even shared in linguistic exchanges. When the pickup glider was finally sent to retrieve all the soldiers, medics, and the filmmaker from the clearing, they all helped in stretching out the cloth from the parachutes so they could be easily located. The glider came in, and after landing was positioned for takeoff with help from the Donnie. To pull them all out of the valley, the glider and complementary plane needed to perform a snatching technique. For it, A 300-foot nylon rope made from donated stockings was then brought out to be looped and held up by poles so the pickup plane's hook could grab onto it. At the other end, the rope was hooked to the glider so it could be towed. The plane had to pull the glider up till they both reached over 12,000 feet, the altitude necessary to fly over the mountains. The story of the crash and the survivors immediately caught the attention of the international media. Reporters would flock to the flights that showered provisions on the contingent of survivors and rescuers on the ground. How to get the survivors out of the valley presented a significant challenge. Helicopters could not climb over the surrounding mountains, and the high altitude also meant any powered aircraft would have great difficulty taking off again from a short jungle runway if one even managed the land in the first place. Finally, it was decided that the only aircraft that could safely get in and out of the valley were gliders. The high altitude rescue was performed using Waco CG-4 gliders towed by a Douglas C-47 Skytrain, the same type of plane that had crashed originally. Three separate rescues for each of the survivors were performed by towing a glider with a single pilot into the valley. The glider was then loaded and towed back to the base. Reports indicate that the first glider sustained damage from low flight over trees and a whipping parachute that was snagged at takeoff. A second CG-4 was used for the remaining two rescues. All three survivors made it back to base safely. Mitchell Zukoff, a professor of journalism at Boston University, recounted the epic tale in his 2011 book, Lost in Shangri-La, a true story of survival, adventure, and the most incredible rescue mission of World War II. 
His book was based on a lengthy diary kept by the lone female survivor, Corporal Margaret Hastings, which had turned up at a small historical society in upstate New York. Betty B.B. McCullum, widow of the uninjured survivor, Lieutenant John McCullum, provided a cache of photographs, as well as the word-of-mouth testimony of her husband. The Baliam Valley is today part of the Indonesian province of Papua. While the Dani have modernized in many ways, they still exist as a source of fascination to outsiders. The local government, however, has found it far more convenient to continue labeling the resource-rich land uninhabited.